Well, hey folks, this video is meant to give you the brief historical context behind the film that we're covering for this week, Kingdom of Heaven. Now, keep in mind, we are looking at peace and conflict studies, and we're trying to examine the different reasons why people have been drawn to the sword throughout time. And for this particular film, it's a, it's a great movie uh, if you watch the director's cut, not the theatrical version. Um, and we're going to be looking at religion and how religion has been a big source of arguments over the course of time. There are no better examples of this than over 200 years, the nine crusades that were led to the Holy Lands to fight between Christians and Muslims. Now, as we get into this, uh, th you should know that this is a period of time that a lot of people really don't know a lot about, either because records weren't kept or because we just focus on other things uh, besides this brief 200 year stint of time. So with it, what you should really know to really start to understand this process or these series of wars um, is that religion, religion, religion is extremely important. What religion you profess, what religion you believe in, what God you believe in, uh, what that God believes is significant in not only establishing where you're at in society, like your social class, but also how you relate to other people who are of different faiths or people who are of the same faith. Um, to believe something different from the main dominant church was extremely heretic and could easily call for you being executed, burned at the stake, declared a witch, um, declared satanic, um, and really having a lot of consequences for whether or not you could survive in this this kind of type of society. So before I show you some maps, what you really know about is that Catholicism, um, the Catholic Church, which has the Pope at its head and says that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, meaning that the, the, the Pope is the embodiment of Christ on earth uh, until Christ comes again. The Pope is extremely important in the Catholic Church. Um, there's also a lot of traditions and rituals that happen in the Catholic Church. And if you are Catholic, there are a lot of things that you are expected to follow or do, um, including kneeling before the power of the Pope. And, and in many ways, the Pope is not only a religious leader, he has also been a political leader throughout time and most importantly in this time um, of human history. So um, on the other side of that, you have Islam, which is the other dominant world religion throughout northern Africa and Arabia. Um, which believes in the God Allah. And so Christianity and um, Islam claim to have the same roots in looking at Abraham, uh, not only in the Bible, but also in the Quran and even in the Torah uh, for, the, for, the Jude, uh, for Judaism. So with it, even though there's a lot of similarities in what they believe about God slash Allah, um, how they have come to, I, to see this God of theirs, there is a lot of conflict between Christians and Muslims around this period of time enough to where they're going to go to war um and have hundreds of thousands of innocent uh people slaughtered on both sides because they're fighting over this holy land now um the church is the dominant source of power kings are not allowed to be kings until that king has gone through the official ceremony of kneeling before the pope and the the pope himself um with the permission of god placing the crown upon the king's uh helmet or the head if you do not go through that process you are considered illegitimate and a lot of people will actually revolt at this point in time against kings that are not officially sanctioned by the catholic church kings must always obey the pope and the church as for a lot of the uh european countries at this time um warfare is the name of the game the other name of the game is feudalism what that means is it's a, it's a complex system where peasants are at the very bottom of society they are farmers who live on the estates or the vast land holdings of barons slash nobles. Peasants are uh, taxed by the nobles on, who live on their land um, for the ability to be able to, for the peasants to be able to pit, like basically do subsistence farming. As the peasants farm their own crops, part of that crop then goes to the, the noble who owns the property that the peasant lives on. It's a lot more complex than that. But in order for a noble to be a noble, they have to be given permission by the king or queen or royalty of that realm to be able to have vast land holdings. In return, the nobles taxed heavily by the crown, um, not only in terms of money and crops and grain, but also in terms of troops. In times of war, it's expected that as a noble, you can be called upon by your king to furnish and provide knights and other types of troops um, for the crown to be able to wage war across the land and in other countries. 
Uh, if you fail to uh, uh, to pay your taxes as a noble, if you fail to uphold and provide those the uh, contributions in times of warfare and in, in peace, uh, your rights to holding land and of nobility are taken from you. So in order to really get ahead, you really want to have your king's favor. The king really wants the pope's favor. Over 200 years, a series of nine crusades, uh, diff each one's a different war um, by different groups of people. But at the end of the day, it's always going to boil down to uh, Christians trying to take back the Holy Land from the Muslims. Okay, the Holy Land being Jerusalem and the surrounding area, which Christ was said to live around and also be crucified around. Um, now, throughout these these 200 years, as I've said before, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be slaughtered. Um, a lot of them just innocent civilians living their lives in the wrong place at the wrong time. For the film, though, we're going to focus on at just after the First Crusade near 1184 in France. Uh, that's where our main characters are going to come from. And uh, it's going to be at the start of the Second Crusade where um, the Muslims, after being originally thrown out, and the, the, the First Crusade is a victory for the Christians. The, fir the, the Christians are able to take over Jerusalem, control the city, and establish another Christian kingdom in that area. Um, they even elect and have their own king and his royal court and barons in that land as well. Um, but over a period of time, the Muslims are able to regroup, especially under Salah Hadin or Saladin. You might hear his name pronounced differently depending on who you talk to. But Salah Hadin is, is the major Muslim ruler that's going to wage another crusade or be the cause of another crusade to, to save the Holy Land from, from the Muslims. Now, uh, just to give you an example of kind of how where we're at in the map, over here... In this uh, right-hand corner, you'll notice that this is the Holy Land. It is smack dab right in the middle of Muslim territory. Muslims control a majority of northern Africa, Arabia, Turkey, um, and they'll further push into Europe this way in the coming years or the coming centuries. But they also all, uh, own a lot of the Iberian Peninsula, which currently is uh, Spain and Portugal primarily. And so... They're going to own and control these ter all these territories. Uh, Islam is the dominant religion. However, just the north, throughout much of Europe, the one thing that unites all these different kingdoms and uh, peoples and uh, principalities is that allegiance to the Holy Roman Empire, which is headquartered in Rome with the Pope. So Catholicism unites all of Europe here. Uh, Islam unites all the Muslims throughout here. Okay. So not every Christian was the same type of Christian, but one thing that they all kind of agreed on was, hey, um, this is the Holy Land down here. We should lead a series of uh, armies down here to try to take out uh, Muslim armies from holding on to this territory because this is where Christ lived. And Muslims don't see Christ as as important as Christians do, so therefore they, they should take over the, the territory. Another thing to think about when it comes to feudalism, this is a very complex socioeconomic and political order. What it basically boils down to is in a society, at the top of the pyramid, you've got the king and the church. The church also often takes supremacy over the king. The king in turn sponsors the church, and it's expected that everyone below the king must follow the religion uh, and uphold the doctrines of the Catholic Church, especially in uh, Western Europe. Just below them, they have the nobles. The nobles are given their power through the orders of the king. The king is able to say, look, you're a noble because you are of a certain type of blood and house, and your bloodline is more important than peasants, uh, so therefore your kids are also, in a way, royalty. You may also have relatives of the king who um, are often treated as nobles just because they, they're kept close to the court, but not too close because the king doesn't want too many rivals within their family that could also claim the throne. Towns are becoming increasingly important. More and more people are starting the process of moving to towns instead of just living out in the countryside. But at this point in time, peasant, peasantry and living in the countryside and farming for your own food is going to be extremely important as well. Uh, lords are going to be like knights and individuals who are on the next level. Um, they are going to be the soldiers and rank and file individuals who are one step above peasants. Yet, uh, So it comes with a few privileges no matter what they are but you might notice that these are like blacksmiths artisans uh crafts people who have different sets of skills than just farmers and then on the very bottom you have over here it says freemen these individuals who don't claim loyalty or have to pay taxes to a nobleman but they still have they're still in the, considered the lower rung society and then peasants are serfs who are tied to the land that they live on they are of course living on the lands owned by nobles 
And in turn, in theory, all land is owned by the king and all land is owned by the church. So you can see that no matter where you're at in society, you're always paying homage to the church and to the king for uh, God and for country. Now, to give you a little bit of a timeline with how exactly all of these crusades played out, I'm not going to go over everything, but the one, the two that you need to know for the film, First Crusade is going to be the People's Crusade. It's going to be the Pope calling on anyone and everyone of uh, peasant status, specifically knights and nobles, um, to ready their arms, to go to take out Jerusalem. At this point in time, you either got in a boat and sailed across the Mediterranean to get to Jerusalem, or you just marched across Europe. Um, if you didn't die from the journey or get extremely sick, um, you at least appreciated the good views, hopefully. Um, and after the cru First Crusade started, after a series of uh, uh, battles and years, the Christians were actually able to take control of Jerusalem. It was considered a major victory. The problem was, was that after they took over the city, a lot of the army just left because they were like, well, uh, our job here is done. And so after they left, it created a really big opportunity for, over time, Muslims to regroup uh, and to slowly start to re kind of reconquer and uh, bring their influence upon the territory. So it called for about 50 years later um, for the Second Crusade, where now the Crusaders are starting to try to expand their Christian territory, but they also are threatened by Salah Hadin, who is a major and very intelligent and clever strategist on the battlefield. He's a Muslim ruler that uh, poses a big threat. One thing, other one I'll mention is the Fifth Crusade. It's the Children's Crusade. Um, it was a complete slaughter for thousands of children specifically poor uh, poor children all throughout France and several other countries that they walk through. But basically this boy, this peasant child, believes that he's given visions of God or by God to go reclaim the Holy Land. And they believe that they'll just walk into Jerusalem and that the Muslims will basically either flee or give the city to them. So they basically just walk across Europe uh, with no food, no planning, uh, no any like nothing of any sub substantial value in terms of supplies. And they just go with the blind faith that God will provide. Many of them die along the way. When they do eventually make it to Jerusalem, I believe Stephen, Stephen of Cloyes, he's already died um, way in advance, but they kept going. And when they finally get there, they're all slaughtered by the Muslims who laugh and basically say, why would you ever think that we would just give you a free city? Um, so with it, a lot of these crusades, I believe one, the first one, and I believe one of the other ones through here, achieve, uh, give some moderate Christian victories. But at the very end of the day, a lot of the time, it just was a complete slaughter on behalf of the Christians, um, with many Muslims also being uh, sacrificed as well. Both sides committed mass atrocities, to be fair. All right. Now, another visual for you. You can see that all of these different crusades launched from different points in time. Um, it was almost said that a lot of the generations of Europe were wiped out by how many armies were sent to the Middle East, all for these holy lands right down here. Okay, And so for all this territory, we lose a lot of individuals, not only on the European side, but also on the Arabian slash Islamic side. Now, as for the main characters, Balian de Ibelin, he's a French blacksmith. He's of no important birth. He doesn't know who his father is. He just recently got married to his wife. His wife dies um, and after miscarriage. Um, she commits suicide because she's not able to handle the thought of her losing her child. Um, and at that point in time, the Catholic Church teaches that if you commit suicide, that's one of the gravest sins and you'll never be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. So uh, when she's buried, he doesn't know it at the time, but um, his half-brother, the priest, we'll talk about here in a second, actually has her beheaded because um, her body is cursed. He is the illegitimate son of son of Godfrey of Ibelin, who I'll talk about soon. He is asked by his father to go with him to Jerusalem to work on the estate and to provide and basically carry on the legacy of the Godfrey of Ibelin and to pledge loyalty to the, the, the Christian King Baldwin IV, who was the ruler of Jerusalem at that time. Um, he's also responsible for defending the city, and he's our principal main character. Um he is also very clever. He knows that when he gets to Jerusalem and he finally sees his father's estate after his father passes away, um, he's able to use irrigation, working with the land, providing water that actually nourishes the land and brings the crops and grows. Um, he basically has a really healthy relationship with the people who work on the estate as well. Um, after Reynaud de, de Chatillon, or Chatillon is, uh, he's a terrible person, but after um, Reynaud 
has Saladin come to his castle at Carrick, and there's almost a massive battle. There's a compromise where um, Balian is almost killed trying to defend innocent villagers because he just happens to be in the middle of the conflict and he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, with it, he's going to have to defend these innocent villagers um, and try to make sure that Raynell is held to, held to punishment. At the very end of the film, um, he tries to marry Sibylla, um, but S and Sibylla kind of proposes. King Baldwin approves, but unfortunately, Balian says, look, I'm too good of a person. My morals do not allow me to go kill Guy Guy de, de Lusignan, um, who basically wants to have Luz, uh, the, the crown of Jerusalem for himself. More on this as we kind of go through these slides. But this movie is three hours and 13 minutes. It's a great film, but there's a lot that goes on. The priest of Ebeline is actually uh, Balian's half-brother through his mom. Um, the priest is basically this really corrupt, non-likable character. He basically has his sister-in-law beheaded while, before she's buried. He also steals her crucifix. So he's killed in the movie at the very beginning by Balian um, after Balian's been asked by his father to go to Jerusalem. So as he's kind of weighing over this decision, he just recently lost his wife and his only son um, in miscarriage. And so therefore, after he kills his brother, he realizes he has to flee because if not, he'll help punishment um, or he'll, he'll be punished for killing a priest. Godfrey is the father of Balian. He had basically when he was younger, he um, flirted a lot, and then, and it led to Balian over here on the left, or on the right hand side, being born. He later re revisits uh, Balian after realizing that he is his son, and also when he's trying to leave a legacy, thinking about what's going to happen after he dies because he knows that he's uh, getting older in age. So. Uh, he admits to Balian that he's his father. He asks Balian to come with him to Jerusalem and to look over the estate and also to pledge allegiance to King Baldwin IV, the Christian ruler of Jerusalem, especially because he knows that Salah Hadin is a major ruler who could easily overtake Jerusalem if he tried. Um, unfortunately, on the way back after Balian joins him, he is shot with an arrow. It's, he's mortally wounded, and Godfrey will later die just after making it back to Jerusalem. Before he dies, he will knight Balian and basically uh, give him uh, the estates that he's uh, earned over time in France and also in Jerusalem. King Baldwin IV, you'll notice that he's got this interesting costume on throughout the entire movie, but it's because leprosy, which is a disease that uh, it starts by a bacteria and that bacteria slowly eats away at your body. It causes your body to start decomposing even while you're alive. Um, if you look up some images of it, which trigger warning before you do, just know what you're looking at, know what you're getting into. Um, it's a it's a disease where your body literally just, just decomposes and, and you slowly die because your body is literally eating itself. Um, so at this point in time, not much is known about leprosy. Uh, it is believed that if you have it, you are unclean, that you are not clean in the, sight, in the eyes of God. Uh, and therefore, a lot of people who do have leprosy are shunned from society. They're outcasts. They're even lower than peasants. And if you have leprosy, you used to have to go into a city shouting leprosy because – or I'm a leper because – it was commanded that like no one wanted to be near you in case they got it. It is very contagious, but you have to be around somebody for a significant period of time in order to really get it. So King Baldwin IV is a very genuine, nice king of Jerusalem. He knows the precious, fragile po uh, political system that he's that he has in control of. Um, he also knows that as his leprosy gets worse, he's he's gonna there's gonna be a major power vacuum, and it's gonna be up to anyone who claims the throne to really try to make sure that that peace holds on. Um, he knows that he's the only one strong enough to really hold on to it at the moment. And his nephew, who's his successor and who's the son of Sibylla, his sister, um, may not be able to hold control because he's too young. So over time, King Baldwin IV is gonna meet Balian. He's gonna say, "Look, you're an all right dude." I want you to marry my sister so that and take control of the armed forces, not from this Guy de Lusignan guy who I don't trust. Balian's going to say no. King Baldwin IV is going to die after trying to defend the city from Salah Hadin. And uh, unfortunately, it's going to leave a big, massive power vacuum. Sibylla is the sister to King Baldwin IV. Her, his, uh, since he does not have a son, her child, Baldwin V, is the next successor. So whenever uh, King Baldwin IV dies, her son's going to take over. She knows this, and she knows that whoever is married to her, since her child is so young but he's going to be king, the parents are going to have a really big say on what happens in the, in the kingdom of Jerusalem. So 
when she falls in love, she's originally pledged to marry Guy de, de Lusignan, but obviously she doesn't like him because he's not a very likable guy uh, and knows that he just sees her for her power and influence, but he's not even faithful to her in the first place. So eventually she'll fall in love with Balian de Adelian. Um, she will eventually try to get him to marry her. Um, she unfortunately is refused, declined. That brings her disappointment, but she continues to try to push forward and trying to make sure that she's as good of a queen regent for uh, the kingdom of Jerusalem as possible after her brother dies. Unfortunately, after her brother dies and she becomes queen regent and her, her son is named the successor of the next king, she realizes that he's showing signs of leprosy himself and that in order to try to save her child from the problems and trauma that come with being a leper, she kills him while he's young so he doesn't have to go through that process. He late, she later gives the crown to Guy and then flees the city, and that's the last we see of her in the entire film. Salahadin, or as Saladin, as you might see it spelled in English, uh, in reality it's Salahadin. Uh, Salah is like a very well-known um, Muslim word for a, a ruler. Uh, a lot of the times it's also a holy position. Salahadin is a very clever tactician. He's someone that's very experienced in battle. One word from him can easily bring an entire army of Muslims against an entire city. So he's got influence, he's got pull, he's got traction, and he knows that this fragile truce with King Christian, uh, King Baldwin IV, can only last for a period of time. So he's waiting for the right moment to strike. Um, at one point, Reynaud de Chatillon, Ch Chatillon, who is a major friend and ally of Guy de Lusignan, um, he's going to have a caravan attacked. Salah Hadin, knowing that this is a violation of the truce, pulls up his armies, goes to try to find Reynaud de Chatelon to try to punish him and bring him to to, to account for his, his crimes. They go to the castle Carrick, where Reynaud's at, and uh, basically hiding with villagers inside the castle. Forced to defend the castle because it is a Christian uh, army that's there at Carrick, King Baldwin meets up with Salah Hadin and says, look, we, we know that this is due to the actions of one stupid person. So if we give you and we punish this Reynald guy, will you retreat? Salah Hadin, being a very honorable guy, says, fine, I will agree to that. But l let it be known that if anything ever happens again, that will be the official breaking of our truce. So Salah Hadin retreats, waits for the right moment. And eventually after Reynald is released from prison by Guy, who is now the newly crowned king, uh, Reynald kills his Salahadin's sister. Salahadin readies the armies, and, and then that's when we get to the final battle scene in the movie. Ultimately, Salahadin wins because the Christians are too disunited and disorganized um, between too many different competing rulers that he uh, basically kicks them out and sends them to the coast. Guy de, de Lusignan is actually a knight templar. Um, who He's a noble from France. He's, his job is to try to protect the kingdom of Jerusalem, but as you see in the movie, he's really about himself and trying to make sure that he's making sure he's where he needs to be to be the most successful. He wants to claim the throne of Jerusalem for himself. He will have Sibylla as his wife. They're already married, but he's not faithful at all. Um, and so he just sees her as an opportunity to the throne. Um, he's jealous of Balian after discovering that Sibylla and her son, the prince, also like Balian more than they do Guy. When King Baldwin IV dies from leprosy, Guy is going to sneak in and basically try to take control of the city for himself. He's going to use the armies that are loyal to him uh, to try to uh, install a coup where he's made king over Baldwin V. Um, as he does that, he is going to be crowned king uh, after Sibylla gives him the crown. To the kingdom of Jerusalem. He's going to release his friend Reynald. Reynald de Chatillon is going to go kill the sister of Saladin, and then that's what wages the final war. And our very last character that you probably will not like, Reynald de Chatillon is a, is a very, uh, he does not have very positive ideas or attitudes towards anyone who's Muslim. So with that, as you see him in the movie, he is always on the go trying to see what he can do to create conflict with Muslims. Um, and so when he when he attacks Salah Hadin's caravans and, and basically forces Salah Hadin to like bring his army to Carrick, Reynold's going to hide behind the castle and eventually is is brought is thrown to a dungeon as part of that deal between King Baldwin IV and Salah Hadin. Once he's released by Guy, he's then going to go kill Salah Hadin's sister, forces Salah Hadin to bring his army into Jerusalem, and that's what finally starts the battle. Balian in the very last scene is going to try to defend the city from Salahuddin, but he knows it's a it's a pointless cause. 
All right. If you have any questions about this very long but also very well done movie, hit me up. I hope you're having a great one. I look forward to seeing you in class, and let's watch some movies on the Crusades.